Hey, JR200. It is Sunday, June 20th. Happy Father's Day. And um, for those of you who celebrated yesterday, happy Juneteenth. And um, we're getting close to the end of class. Yay. Your midterm is due by the end of the day yesterday. <laughs> so <laughs> if you didn't do the midterm, I will contact you or you can contact me and we'll figure something out. Okay, let's go into this week's uh, topics. We have three things this week that we're going to talk about and um, only one assignment for the last week. Uh, let's see, I'm getting down there, getting down there, getting down there, and we are doing uh, living wills. Okay, so this is week five, part two. I'm going to move this up here and we have it in student view. So one of the things we're going to talk about is planning, planning for end of life, planning for um points in your life when you may have diminished capacity to make decisions for yourself. This week we'll be talking about um, healthcare issues, we'll be talking about financial issues. And I want to go through this really cool um, national NIA uh, sheet called Getting Your Affairs in Order, some tips from the National Institute on Aging. And there are many, many good resources for information about this. So um, once you turn 18, you should probably start thinking about and putting into place um, healthcare decision-making documents. So a living will or a durable power of attorney for healthcare. Because once you turn 18, as you probably know, your parents can't um, necessarily make those decisions for you anymore. And so it's a good idea to choose someone, whether it is your friend, your relative, uh, you know, someone that you trust, to be a healthcare decision maker for you in the event that you're in an accident or that you become ill and you can't make decisions for yourself. So, um, but mostly older people deal with these issues because as you get older, you're going to have more health issues. You're going to be more likely to need medical treatment. So um, one thing that we have done in our family, we have a durable power of attorney for healthcare. I have named John as my number one decision maker. I've named my two children who are 25 and 20 as my second and third decision makers. And so in the event that something happens to me and I can't make decisions for myself, they will be able to communicate with my doctors and and decide you know, what kind of treatment I'm, I'm going to have. So I do encourage you, like I said, to be thinking about this after you turn 18. There's, it's, it's never too soon to get these very simple, easy documents uh, put together. Um, but definitely if you are older and are diagnosed with a serious disease or a chronic condition, it's also um, a great time to be making these types of uh, decisions. So what do we want to talk about? Living wills are you telling a doctor what to do if you are near death. So living wills talk about things like, do I want CPR? Do I want to be put on a ventilator? Do I want artificial nutrition and hydration? Um, do I want comfort care? And so um, those are good discussions to have with your doctor because your doctor can kind of explain the ins and outs. Um, CPR on TV always works. In real life, CPR doesn't work for, for most people. Now, if you're young and healthy and your heart suddenly stops, um, CPR can bring you back and you're probably going to do pretty well. If you are a person with advanced cancer, if you are a much older person, if you're a person that already has some significant health problems, the chances of you of CPR being successful kind of go down to maybe one to five percent. So it's not as, um, as much of a, of a magical tool as you might be led to believe on TV. So one of the decisions you can say in your living will is if my heart stops, yes, I want CPR or no, I don't. Um, the other thing that people talk about is, do I want to be put on a ventilator? Now, pre-pandemic, pre-COVID, a lot of times people would say, oh, no, I don't want to be put on a ventilator. And then we had this worldwide global pandemic where ventilator treatment was not uncommon um, for people. And it wasn't uncommon for people to go onto a ventilator, stay on it for a week or two, come off and recover and walk out of the hospital. So it's important to think about when, when would being uh, on a ventilator be okay? Do you wanna be on a ventilator for a week? Do you wanna be on a ventilator for six months? Do you wanna be on a ventilator for five years? Um, and be kept alive by a machine. So those are, those are tough decisions, and sometimes they're tough things to talk about. Um, nutrition and hydration is another big issue. 
Um, if you are unable to feed yourself, do you want a feeding tube? If you are unable to feed yourself, do you want a, an IV that gives you fluids? Do you want a feeding tube that goes um, down your nose into your stomach that gives you um, uh, uh, nutrition and calories to keep you alive? Um, and there's also the oppor opportunity in these documents to say, well, I'd like a trial period of that. Um, but if you aren't able to deal with my underlying illness, you know, try this for a week. And if it doesn't work, then um, I want you to withdraw it. Um, comfort care. Most people are, you know, pro comfort care. That means giving you ice chips if your mouth is dry, giving you pain meds, helping you with problems breathing, helping you with problems that might be caused by pain meds like um, constipation, just helping keep you comfortable. So those are basic decisions that you could incorporate into a living well. And you have to like project forward about quality of life in the future. You know, exactly. If, you know, if, if you're making these decisions, but the, clearly the person is not going to recover, how far do you go with this? And these are good things to talk to a doctor about or a healthcare professional because they can give you kind of uh, some, some insight. For example, when John's mother was on hospice, um, we were told it was better for her in terms of her quality of life and her suffering to not give her nutrition and hydration because the hydration would have caused, probably because she was bedridden, would have caused her lungs to fill up with fluid, would have made it really hard for her to breathe, it would have made her very uncomfortable. So it's good to kind of have a conversation with, with the healthcare um, professional. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about hospice care. Hospice care is intended for people that are at the end of life. So typically you are diagnosed with a disease that will be terminal within the next six months. And then you go, you stop getting treatment for your condition, you go on to hospice care and you're given medications to help you breathe. You're given medications for pain. You have nurses that come visit you and check check your vitals, uh, supports given to your family members, things like that. So hospice care is, is a very important way to improve quality of life at the end of life. And certainly um, it's a very valuable tool. And several members of my family and John's family have had the benefit of hospice care. Um, studies actually show that patients that go into hospice live longer than patients that don't opt for hospice. So it's not, um, it's not all doom and gloom and it can make the transition from life to death a little bit easier. And as an agent, so uh, as Julie said, said, you know, she's in terms of decision making, you know, um, I'm her decision maker, she's mine, and I was there for my mom. And it's a common practice in hospice care, so don't be alarmed by it, that, um, that the uh, company that is running the hospice care is going to be encouraging you to go ahead and up the amount of opioids that are being used to relieve pain, and especially if if the person's not doing well, you know, um, and uh, um, you know it's a, it's it's a tough decision to have to make because um, upping the opioids can ultimately be the cause of death. And uh, but it's you know it's one of those things that you you should become comfortable with because you're going to be advised on that. Yeah, and so in hospice, you'll you'll get advice from a nurse or a doctor that will say, well, this person's experiencing this pain, we're gonna prescribe opioids for that pain. This person may be um, anxious or restless or um, you know, having emotional or, or other kind of anxiety problems that are very common as people get to the end of their lives. So we'll prescribe a, a, a medication for anxiety to relieve that person's distress and help them feel more comfortable. So um, let's go down. <laughs> I'll let you do it. Going to palliative care still? Yes, yeah, so yeah. palliative care is another option. A lot of times people get palliative care and hospice care confused. You can be diagnosed with a serious health condition, but not terminal. Let's say you have metastatic breast cancer and maybe with um, treatment, you could live another eight or 10 years. And yet you have symptoms that may be difficult for you to manage on your own. So palliative care helps do everything that's possible to improve your quality of life, deal with those symptoms that are causing you pain or discomfort or, or problems. And so, Palliative care is kind of broader than hospice care because it's intended for people that just have significant health problems and need help improving their quality of life. Whereas hospice care is really designed for that last six months before you die. So, okay, so you think about all these issues. And again, 
your opinions on these things may change from the time you're 18 or 20 to the time you're 60 or 65 or 75 or 80. Oops, sorry, you, <laughs> you got some wind in our house. We got house. wind. <laughs> Try to door slam. <laughs> so anyway, so if you on. are 20 or 25, you might say, heck yes, I want CPR. Heck yes, I want to be on a ventilator. I feel like I'm young and I'm fit and I'm strong and I'm going to get better. If you are 75 or 85 and you have kidney failure, you've got heart failure, you've got cancer, you may say, you know what, if my heart stops, let me go. And so your attitudes are going to change over time. And for that reason, I encourage people when they create these healthcare documents to go back and update them every five years or when you've got a major life change. If you've gotten married, if you've gotten divorced, if you've had a falling out with the person that you named as your healthcare agent, if you've moved to a different state, um, you should go back and you should recheck these documents every five years or so. So don't forget <laughs> and update them as necessary, because like I said, your, your feelings might change. The person you picked as your health care power of attorney um, might change. So, so you want to continue to go down? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So there's two ways to do this. You have a living will that tells your doctor, this is what I want to do at the end of my life. But what, what is even more useful is to have a durable power of attorney for health care. And so when this durable power of attorney for healthcare, you name someone to act as your agent, just like your real estate agent helps you buy a house, your durable power of attorney agent for healthcare is that agent that's going to make decisions for you if necessary um, in terms of your healthcare. So they can't go into your bank accounts. They can't sell your house. They can't drive your car, whatever. They're just going to be able to communicate with your doctor and say, yes, I think this person needs a blood transfusion or yes, I think this person should have surgery. And the way we've drafted ours, um, they're active right now. So if, if now, if a doctor, let's say I go to the doctor and I say, I don't want a blood transfusion. And John says, well, I have her durable power of attorney for healthcare. And I say, she gets it no matter what. The doctor's going to listen to me because I'm still clearly competent. Right, How, if she was unconscious. If, if I'm unconscious, let's say we get into a car accident, God forbid, and um, I'm unconscious, and then, I gotta then he can make thing. decisions. He can say, I want her to have a, a blood transfusion. I want her to have surgery. I want her to have this procedure done. Um, and so that's, that's um, an important thing to think about. Who do you want to make those decisions? Who do you trust? Who shares your values and beliefs? Who can you communicate well with? Because if you don't have these documents, these legal documents put into place, and she gets into actions and she's unconscious, then um, then I can't make those decisions. Then it's left up to the hospital, yeah. hospital so then, staff to make those so decisions. So then it becomes know? a gray area. Yeah. So since John and I are married, um, it would be likely that the doctor would listen to him and take what he wants, um, you know. But they don't have to. But they don't have to. So what happens if there's a situation where John has a, an opinion about my treatment and the doctor disagrees with it? If John doesn't have a durable power of attorney for healthcare, then you're in a real big mess. But if the doctor wants to do one thing and John wants to do something else and John has a durable power of attorney for healthcare, that gives him a lot more rights and a lot more control over what's happening. And the hospital's going to want to listen to and him. And there are these crazy, you know, out of just scenarios that are out of control, spiraled out of control, like the Terry Schiavo case and all those you know cases like that, where people were kept on life support for years. For many, right? many years, yeah. yes. Yeah. And yeah. quite often in those cases, there are disagreements. In the Terry Schiavo case, there was a disagreement between her parents and her husband about what needed to happen once she was brain dead. Mm -hmm. um, and so she, her parents wanted to keep her alive. Um, the husband said, no, that's not what she would have wanted. And so they had litigation that lasted many, many years and a lot of other stuff that, that went on as well. So there's other types of, of advanced healthcare planning documents that you can use. For example, if you want to scroll down just a little bit, mm -hmm. there is um, a, not, a DNR, a do not resuscitate order. Um, and in some states, you have something called a medical order for life-sustaining treatment um, or a physician order for life-sustaining treatment. So it's called a POLST in California. It's called a MOLST, M-O-L-S-T in New York. And those are similar to a do not resuscitate order, but just have a little more detail, a few more options to say, yes, I want CPR. Yes, I want comfort treatment. Yes, I want um, sedation or, or pain relief or something like that. So, but typically a, a DNR says, don't, 
don't bother with CPR for me. And um, people who have a, a DNR, you're going to also want to have either a necklace or a bracelet um, that says DNR on it. Um, you can buy, you can get these through um, uh, organizations that are approved by the state of California. So that if um, if you are found unconscious and someone calls 911 and the paramedics come, their default is going to be to do CPR. They don't want to let you go without trying. But if they see that you have that bracelet or necklace that says you've got a DNR, then they're more likely to respect it and um, and not attempt to restart your heart. So um, go down. Um, there you go. The important thing, once you have a, a, a living will or a durable power of attorney for health care, you need to make sure that the person you've named as your agent has a copy. You should make sure that your doctor has a copy. Many states now are starting to have online depositories where you can put it online so that it's available to your doctors. I think that technology and that approach is still pretty new. Um, but it's just important to know that if you have this document, don't just shove it in a drawer in a filing cabinet and not have it available. When John's mother was reaching the end of her life, we kept a copy of her health care power of attorney in our car so that if we needed it, if something happened at the hospital, if we needed to show that documentation, then we would have it you know, available to us no matter you know, where we were when, when the issue happened. You can have this card and keep it in your wallet that says, I have an advanced directive. This is my doctor. These are the people that have copies. So again, make sure that you give copies to the person who is your agent, your doctor, um, you know, your kids, your family members, whatever. And these are some great sources for more information. You do not need a lawyer to... Um, to develop a living will or a durable power of attorney for healthcare. The American Bar Association has great materials. Um, scroll up, there's a, another website. Caring Connections is really good. So that caringinfo.org um, website is really good. You need to make sure that the, um, that the durable power of attorney for healthcare or living will satisfies the requirements in your state. Um, but there are websites that have forms that are, you can go in and say, I want a form for California and it'll take you right there. So um, that's, I think, all I have to say about that part. Um, oh yeah, I do want to say that in the U.S., we are very, very big on freedom and personal autonomy and respecting senior citizens and respecting people that have mental health issues or people that have, um, you know, developmental issues that to the extent possible, we want to respect those people and their independence and allow them to make decisions for themselves. So this individual freedom and individual autonomy really runs through our medical establishment, runs through our legal establishment in terms of how we treat people who are vulnerable, people like older people, people with mental health issues, et cetera. So remember that we want to preserve their, their freedom to make their own choices as long as we can so that we're not substituting our judgment for that person's judgment. So we want to respect their privacy. We want to respect um, their ability to, to make informed decisions. We want to um, tell them the truth. And this is really counter to what a lot of other cultures and a lot of other countries do, because there are many countries in the world where if your grandparent is diagnosed with cancer, the doctor tells the family but doesn't tell the patient because the doctor doesn't want to upset them. I totally get that. And it's really hard when you're a doctor and you're placed in that position of having to deliver bad news. But in the U.S., that would be considered basically malpractice to not tell the patient what's going on and to not fully inform the patient. So we do have a different take on things here. So the other thing we want to talk about a little bit is um, diversity and cultural diversity in and caregiving and cultural diversity in, in our approach to aging and long-term care, et cetera. So one of the things we've challenged you to do this week is imagine that you are the administrator of a long-term care facility and think about what you would do to, to address and promote um, a sensitivity to the diversity of experience among older people. And so we've given you a little link to the APA, the American Psychological Association, and they have some great documents just talking about the fact that it's not loading. Oh. <laughs> it's I'm slow, sorry. slow. Okay. It's it's just scroll down a little bit if you can. Yeah. It's it's kind of doing the la la thing. 
But anyway, so they, they talk about all the different ways that we see diversity in aging. So for example, our, our LGBTQ community has a very different experience than our non-LGBTQ community in terms of aging. Our um, white community might have a different experience than our Latino community or the community of our Black Americans or Asian Americans. And so we're all going to come at this a little bit different. Um, so I think it's really important when you're, when you're um, running a facility to keep in mind who your audience is, who, who the patients are, and what are their needs, and respect those needs, and try to educate yourself about it. So they've got some great resources. So you just click um, on the hyperlinks in the, in in the APA. In, in, in a world where we're connected better, you'd be getting it, but yes, we're not. So yeah. I'm not going to worry about it's it. It's right slow now. lately. Okay, that's okay. And then, then we have some really cool videos. We have some videos cool videos. Right and these, these will come up. Um, Oh, and I experiences them. and beliefs can color our day-to-day -day behavior without us even realizing it. Our workplaces. So, anyways, we don't need to watch the whole video, but they're really <laughs> both really cool videos about diversity in um, the uh, you know the care facility uh, domain. Okay. Cool. Okay. I encourage you all um, because many many of our students come from very diverse backgrounds. So I encourage you to post your, your experience and your knowledge and your thoughts about how your community handles older people and, and what are the important things, you know, and, and in, my, in my heritage and my community, food is really important and, and um, respecting the elderly person's wisdom and knowledge and experience is really important, but it's going to be different for everybody. And you get like a place like San Clemente, right? The surf culture. So you know what? Do something surf culture in your yeah. facility. You know, you look like a place in Arcadia, and it's a lot more diverse. You know, and so what do we you know? Um, I, I have a, a lot of friends that uh, are Asian Pacific Islanders, and and their families uh, have settled into the Arcadia area. So you're going to have to redirect your facility to uh, match the cultural needs of that group, so. Exactly, right. so yeah, so tell us what your thoughts and your experience and your knowledge is, because I think that's one of the great things about these discussions is mm -hmm. everything that you guys bring to the table and we can learn a lot from each other. Um, and so I think that's everything. That's it, all right guys, very, very cool. Look at how beautiful there she is. That was, that's uh, right, before, <laughs> right before we got married. It's a right? long time ago. Ah, it's, uh, still, still just as beautiful. Okay, we'll see you guys next time.